Hello, friends. I'm so happy you joined us today. It's another exciting episode of Talking Heads of Atascacita. And my name is Amy Bridwell. I'm here with our beloved pastor, Monsignor Golosinski. And Monsignor, we have another forgotten anniversary today. But would you... It seems like it's forgotten, but let's pray first. Let's do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. And direct us, O Lord, in all our actions, that every work and prayer may begin with thee, and through thee be successfully completed, through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Maximilian Colby. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. A forgotten anniversary, mm-hmm. question mark. Mm-hmm. What's the anniversary? It is the anniversary of the end of World War II. A.K.A. V.J. Day. Mm-hmm. When, war, when the war ended in Europe, we called it V.E. Day, mm-hmm. and we called this date, August the 14th, V.J. Day, mm-hmm. although the formal surrender ceremony took place uh, a couple weeks from now. Mm-hmm. But effectively, the war was over. We mm-hmm. celebrated it back in those days mm-hmm. uh, on the 14th. Mm-hmm. We said comment about how the war began on the uh, eve of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December 7th, Mm -hmm. and it ended on October 14th, the eve of the Feast of the Assumption. Assumption. Mm -hmm. And I had just learned, without looking up material for what we're going to devote ourselves to today, that during World War II, there were 750,000 Texans who served. That's a lot of Texans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what was the population mm-hmm. at that time? Mm-hmm. That was, that was you know, the 1940s. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was ordained in 1958, the population of the state was in a 9 million bracket. Mm-hmm. So like 750,000. Mm-hmm. Good Lord, what a large number. Mm-hmm. And anyway... Uh, families and fathers, sons and brothers halfway across the globe in opposite directions to defend their country on two fronts. Mm -hmm. Some families send more than one person, a phenomenon depicted in the blockbuster Saving Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. Now, my uh, my dad's youngest brother, we didn't see him for years. I mean, he was, uh, he went to England early Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, he was in a tank destroyer. He, he was a major at the end of uh, World War II. And uh, a first cousin of my dad, he was in the artillery. He was in the Pacific. He was mm-hmm. a, uh, a lieutenant colonel mm-hmm. at the end of uh, World War II. Mm-hmm. And my mother's, uh, my mother's brother mm-hmm. uh, landed on uh, Normandy on D-Day 6. And so it's true. You know, mm-hmm. We had all these family members scattered all over the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, there was one family, one family, through the Rippkoski family, uh, it says here Dayton, Texas, mm-hmm. what I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. However, they really were from a little, little place called Eastgate. Mm-hmm. Eastgate was a little town mm-hmm. uh, between Crosby mm-hmm. and, uh, and Dayton. Okay. They're in the eastern part of the county. Mm-hmm. Uh one summer, I was sent temporarily to look after the parish in Crosby. Mm-hmm. And in those days, Dayton, uh, uh, Eastgate was too small to be a parish. It was mm-hmm. a mission. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had masses and weddings there at uh, Eastgate. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I wonder if any of them were from the Ripkowski family. Oh, mm-hmm. I bet but they anyway, were. Mm-hmm. Uh, born in New Waverly. Mm-hmm. You know, up in Central Texas, mm-hmm. uh, as first-generation Americans, Stash mm-hmm. Ripkowski and Maddie Obrick wed and had 16 children from 1914 to 1936. Mm-hmm. On a 200-acre plot of land, mm-hmm. Ripkowski's made their home in southeast Texas and worked as sharecroppers during the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. Little did they know that their parents' homeland, Poland, infamously invaded by the Germans in 1939, and made the unfortunate sight of six of the deadliest concentration camps mm. would become a central part of the global conflict to come. Mm-mm-mm. Most know the story behind the date which will live in infamy, 
on December 7th, 1941. But for those at the time, it was even more of a shock than history books can accurately convey. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. You know, I was only uh, 1941. I, I was eight years old. I can, I can remember the shock we had. Mm -hmm. and, and how, how did they dare? How did they dare attack us? That was the reaction mm -hmm. on our parts. Mm -hmm. And for many families across America, Uncle Sam came a calling. For many families answered that call. Mm -hmm. From oldest to youngest, the Ripkowskis who served in World War II were Felix, August, Raymond, Bernie, Alex, Leon, Franklin, and Herman. Mm -hmm. Felix fought on two continents on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, August served in the Pacific aboard the USS Reno, which has a, a light. Mm -hmm. uh, cruiser. Mm -hmm. Raymond, a gunner in the Air Force, crashed in New Guinea during a bombing run, but survived and recovered. Mm -hmm. Bernie was stationed in the Aleutian Islands and Alaska in the Army. Alex mm -hmm. fought in Europe with the Army. Leon faced combat in Africa and Europe with the Army, during which he received five campaign stars. Mm -hmm. Franklin served in the Merchant Marine in the Atlantic and later and later drafted again to, uh, and later uh, I was drafted to fight in Korea. Mm -hmm. And Herman served in the Army's 78th Lightning Division, the first division to cross the Rhine River into Germany in the waning months mm -hmm. of the year. Mm -hmm. The three youngest brothers, John, Mike, and Stanley, also served uh, in either peacetime or Korea, bringing the total number of Koskis who served in the military to a whopping 12. 12. 12. And by the brothers. grace of God, every mm -hmm. one of them returned home alive. Mm -mm. It indeed by the grace of God. Mm. In 2007, the family was honored by then Congressman Ted Poe, who stated, quote, if you looked up the word patriot in the dictionary, you would most likely find a photograph of the 12 Rikoski <laughs> brothers in Dayton, Texas, unquote. <laughs> yes, indeed. And according to the record, Franklin said of their service, quote, medals didn't interest us. Our minds were on doing our jobs and doing it better every day, unquote. Mm. He further added, to this day, it makes us feel proud to be Americans when we see the beautiful stars and stripes fluttering in the breeze. Mm -hmm. That perspective, underappreciated today from a man who sacrificed more than uh, both then and today, mm -hmm. and who served by the side of some who sacrificed even more. Mm -hmm. Mike added, we did it to serve our country. We were just hardworking country folk. Mm -hmm. They are an eternal example of the service and sacrifice given to protect freedom for our nation. Mm -hmm. They are a good example for all of us, especially our younger generation, that Poe continued. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. In 2014, the family was honored with a historical marker by the Liberty County Historical Commission. Mm -hmm. And recently in May, Franklin passed away, leaving John, Mike, and Anna Lee as the only survivors of that Rutkowski mm -hmm. generation. So mm -hmm. two of the brothers are still alive, mm -hmm. and one sister. Mm -hmm. This simple country couple, whose family only one generation before immigrated from a country with a rapidly waning window of freedom to one which offered them nothing more than the promise of that recognizable freedom and opportunity, returned the favor by sending most of their sons off to serve their country in one of the most dire times of need. Mm -hmm and to a conflict that would be centered on access to the same freedom for millions of people around the world, no less. Mm -hmm. According to Bernie, their father, Stash, was a, quote, tough, hard-working Polish immigrant who instilled the same sense of responsibility and duty in his children, unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, and the father passed away in 1946. Mm -hmm. After the, all the boys came back, huh? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. America has survived, they thrived mm -hmm. because of that sense of responsibility and duty passed from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. The Ripkowskis are one example, although not of an insignificant one, of many such people for whom the nation had to thank for reaching its 243rd birthday, mm -hmm. the greatest experiment in self-government, warts and all, mm -hmm. that has ever existed. Mm -hmm. Dayton's Ripkowski Drive is still there to this day, and the 12 trees planted on the community center grounds honor the memories of the brothers for whom they were planted. Mm -hmm. Twelve men among those giants on whose shoulders Texans stand today. Mm -hmm. What a family. What a yeah. family. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah.
That is an amazing story. Number one, they had 16 kids and they were sharecroppers. Can you imagine? Oh, oh, such hardworking people. And then, like you said, all to send 12, 12 of your sons. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, my goodness. What a family. I hope maybe they might get honored nationally someday. Mm-hmm. They, they certainly mm-hmm. deserve to be. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, I had a conversation once with Dr. Graham at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, now, he was Canadian by birth. Mm-hmm. And he told me that during World War II, although the Catholic population was about one quarter of the population of the country, mm-hmm. uh, we furnished one third mm-hmm. of the military personnel. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Because of the higher birth rate. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, today is the feast of St. Uh, Maximilian Colby, who, mm-hmm. who died at Auschwitz. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I surprised a lot of people last week, I think, when I mentioned how he had been a uh, missionary in Japan. Mm-hmm. I was shocked. Did, you, did I, you know about that? Only because you told me, and I was certainly surprised to learn it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he was a missionary in Japan in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, he re- returned to Poland. And everybody knows the story of his uh, martyrdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was reading this morning in uh, what we call the Ordo. That's the booklet we have that gives us the information about the Feast of the Day. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it, it described as a martyr by injection. Mm-hmm. And I, I was thinking to myself when I read that early this morning, he must be the first martyr, the mm-hmm. first person in the martyrology mm-hmm. who suffered martyrdom by injection. Well, mm-hmm. oh, you know that story, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yes, in, in the bunker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was there at Auschwitz. Now, uh, there, Auschwitz is sometimes referred to as Alps with working out. Mm-hmm. And for a long, long time, I didn't understand what that was all about. Mm-hmm. And when I had that tour of Poland back in 2008, mm-hmm. it was on our itinerary. And mm-hmm. the place where he died, was, those are all solid metal buildings. I mean, uh, brick buildings. Mm-hmm. The complex had been an army base uh of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Mm-hmm. Remember, Poland was divided up between mm-hmm. Russia, Prussia, and uh, uh, Austria. Mm-hmm. And uh, there in the southern part of the country, uh, which was uh, the Austrian portion, mm-hmm. where uh, Auschwitz is, uh, the Austrian-Hungarian army had this army base, and there were these two-story brick buildings. Mm-hmm. And that's what was used at first. Mm-hmm. And at first, they were, they were all Polish, and uh, Russian prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. And then later, outside the city, uh, this bigger complex called Birkenau Mm -hmm. was built. And uh, the buildings were uh, prefabricated buildings that were uh, designed to uh, hold horses for the cavalry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Back in the old days, mm-hmm. back in the old days when the German army uh, had cavalry, mm-hmm. and they were designed to hold, hold 99 horses, mm-hmm. and they shipped those prefabricated things, I guess, from Germany, and they assembled them there. You know, it's about a mile outside of mm-hmm. the uh, town of, of Auschwitz, mm-hmm. and uh, so that's why they talk about Auschwitz Birkenau. Okay. And okay. St. Maximilian Colby was, was starved to death. Well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was starving, and they, you know, you know why they, why they uh, gave him the injection to put him to death? What, they wanted to put somebody, everyone else had died, and they wanted to put somebody else in his place? No, here was the problem. They were unnerving. They were unnerving their mm-hmm. German captors. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. they were there, these men were there, starving to death, mm-hmm. and there would be sounds of hymns being sung, and he was leading them in hymns and in prayers and so forth. Mm-hmm. And that kind of upset some of the, some of the German uh, mm-hmm. guards there. I guess it did. He was announcing the victory of our Lord with, with every breath, huh? 
Oh my you know, God. This, this, this would happen. I mean, goodness would start reaching deep into these people. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the name of Franz Jägenstein No. He was a German, and he was ordered to report to the German army, and he refused to go. Mm-hmm. He refused to go, and what happened was he was arrested, and then he was condemned to death. Mm-hmm. And anyway, he, he was so lovable. Mm-hmm. He was so lovable mm-hmm. that the German guards at the prison where he was going to be put to death, they were trying to con- trying to convince him, you know, give in, give in, mm-hmm. go to the military. Everybody else is going to the military. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't do it. Yeah. And they didn't want to put him to death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even though by the, you know, the standards, he was sort of a, a traitor. Yeah. A traitor to the cause. Mm-hmm. So some of these, these people really affected... Uh, affected the, the German guards mm-hmm. that they had. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I want to give some attention to the man who was the uh, one who ran. Well, he, he, he was the one who organized Auschwitz-Birkenauer. Mm. His name was uh, Rudolf Hiss. Mm-hmm. Rudolf Hiss. Don't confuse him with Rudolf Hiss. Okay. How do you spell You know who that? Rudolf Hiss was? Mm-hmm. Not Rudolf Hiss. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was the deputy Fuhrer. He was the number two man mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, under Hitler. Mm-hmm. He and Hitler were imprisoned after their that failed coup, mm-hmm. and uh, they were in the same cell. And, and Hitler dictated Mein Kampf mm-hmm. to uh, Rudolf Hiss. Mm-hmm. So they kind of had a screw loose in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, anyway, this man's name is Rudolf Hiss. Okay. And uh, he uh, was born in 1901, and he was a very precocious person. He mm-hmm. was in the military in World War One, in the German army in World War One. He entered at the age of 14. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Later, he was the youngest non-commissioned officer in the German army at 17. He was the youngest mm-hmm. non-commissioned. So this is a guy with a powerful, powerful personality. Mm-hmm. And then in 1922, he joined the Nazi party when he was 21 years old. Mm-hmm. And then after uh, Hitler came to power, then Himmler got uh, Hitler to uh, approve the formation of the SS. Mm-hmm. And he joined the SS in 1934. Mm-hmm. And uh, from uh, May of 1940, with an interruption about six months until uh, January of 1945, he ran, uh, he ran Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was he was sent there to supervise mm-hmm. the, the first operation, and then mm-hmm. the building of uh, you know, the, the the Birkenau mm-hmm. portion where uh, so many of the Jews were put to death. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway. Uh, Himmler, just before the end of the war, Himmler told him, uh, you know, go hide. Mm-hmm. And what he did was he uh, uh, tried to pass himself off as a, uh, as, a, a James, uh, as a German sailor. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, he was uh, then discovered. The people, you know, our, our forces, uh, were, they were looking for him. Mm-hmm. And anyway, they found his wife and his children. He had five children. Mm -hmm. And the British, they were beating the son, trying to beat information out of the son Mm -hmm. about where the father was. Mm -hmm. Finally, the mother couldn't take it any longer. Mm -hmm. And then she snitched. Mm -hmm. And so that's how he was captured. Mm -hmm. But listen, listen how he began his life. Mm -hmm. He was born in Mm Baden-Baden into a strict Catholic family. Mm -hmm. He lived with his mother. Lena and father Franz Xavier Hiss, mm. and he was the oldest of three children and the only son. And uh, he was kind of a lonely child. Mm. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, he claimed in his autobiography that he had been briefly abducted by Gypsy in his youth. Mm-hmm. His father had been an army officer uh, who served in German East Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
before, oh, back in the, in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. And he brought his son up in a strict way, mm-hmm. strict religious principles and with military discipline. Mm-hmm. And he wanted his son to enter the seminary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he had, his grew up with an almost fanatical belief in the central role of duty mm-hmm. the moral life. And during his early years, there was a constant emphasis on sin, guilt, and need to do penance. Mm-hmm. But then World War I came, mm-hmm. and like I said, at the age of 14, he mm-hmm. got into the German army. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Himmler sent him uh, to uh, what is uh, the southeastern uh, part of, uh, of Poland, which Germany had the next after mm-hmm. it invaded in 1939. Mm-hmm. And uh, he uh, was the one responsible for the uh, extermination of all of those mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I forgot to mention that that building at Auschwitz, mm-hmm. the army base, it was uh, after Poland became independent after World War One. It was a, 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 a base of the uh, uh, Polish army. Mm-hmm. So, what I want to get to here at the end is uh, after his trial in Poland, mm-hmm. which he was found guilty mm-hmm. and then condemned to death, uh, he was told to write a, a memoir. And uh, it's interesting, some of the things that he uh, wrote there in mm-hmm. the memoir. Mm-hmm. Uh, My conscience compels me to make the following declaration. In the solitude of my prison cell, I have come to the bitter recognition that I have sinned gravely against humanity. As commander of Auschwitz, I was responsible for carrying out part of the cruel plans of the Third Reich for human destruction. In so doing, I have inflicted terrible wounds on humanity. I caused unspeakable suffering for the Polish people in particular. I am to pay for this with my life. May the Lord God forgive one day what I have done. Mm. I ask the Polish people for forgiveness. In Polish prisons, I experienced for the first time what human kindness is. Mm. Despite all that has happened, I've experienced humane treatment, which I could never have expected, and which has deeply shamed me. When the facts, may the facts which are now coming out about the horrible crimes against humanity make the reputation of such cruel acts impossible for all time. Mm. And before his execution, his return to the, to the faith, on the 10th of April, 1947, uh, he received the sacrament of penance from Father Ladislaus then S.J., provincial of the Polish province of the Society of Jesus. Mm. And on the next day, the same priest administered him, administered him Holy Communion. Wow. And then uh, uh, he wrote a farewell letter to his wife. Now, this is very interesting to me because I had read somewhere I read somewhere that uh, before he died, he said that uh, the greatest regret he had was that he didn't spend more time with his family or something like that. Mm -hmm. And this is all contradicts it completely. Mm -hmm. That that story, I don't know where I where I heard it, but I remember Mm -hmm. hearing it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I repeated that to people. Now this man was so evil Mm -hmm. (laughs) that. Before he died, he said, you know, his greatest regret was he didn't spend more time with his family or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. But he wrote to his wife, based on my present knowledge, I can uh, today see clearly, severely, and bitterly for me that the entire ideology that the world in which I believe so firmly and swervingly was based on completely wrong premises and had to absolutely collapse one day. And so my actions in the service of this ideology were completely wrong, even though I faithfully believed the idea was correct. Mm -hmm. Now, it was very logical that strong doubts grew within me, and whether my turning away from my belief in God was based on completely wrong 
premises is a hard struggle. But I have again found my faith in my God. Hmm. And he then wrote a farewell letter to his children and to his son, mm -hmm. his son the oldest one. Mm -hmm. There were five children. Mm -hmm. Keep your good heart. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good translation. Mm -hmm. I'm like it better keep your heart good. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because a person who lets himself be guided primarily by warmth and humanity mm -hmm. be, become a, a person mm -hmm. who lets himself be guided primarily by warmth and humanity. Mm -hmm. Learn to think and judge for yourself responsibly. Mm -hmm. Don't accept everything without criticism mm -hmm. and as absolutely true. The biggest mistake of my mm -hmm. life was that I believed everything faithfully which came from the top. Mm -hmm. And I didn't dare to have the least bit of doubt about the truth of that which was presented to me. Mm -hmm. In all your undertakings, don't just let your mind speak, but listen above all to the voice in your heart. Mm. Action follows being. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, that's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Who said that? You. <laughs> I heard it from you. Well, Leo the Great. Audre Sacritur Essay was uh, was uh, St. Leo's expression. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you become a child of God, mm -hmm. huh? Mm -hmm. But your action should be that of a child of God. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the idea behind Audre Sacritur Essay. Mm -hmm. Audre means in Latin to act. Sacritur means, of course, follow. And essay means, huh? Mm hmm. Your essence, your being. Which is which, which is exactly what St. Maximilian Colby did in that cell. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What a story. What a story. You know, he was praying for them, too. That is the fruit of a holy life, the conversion of such an evil man. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. mm -mm -mm. Well, you know, St. Paul, in the letter he wrote to the Colossians, which at which time he was in chains. Mm -hmm. He wrote, I fill up in my body the things lacking in the suffering of Christ for mm -hmm. his body, which is the church. Mm -hmm. I fill up in my body the things that are lacking in the sufferings of Christ for his body, which is the church. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine uh, the Colossians uh, before they received the letter, they were thinking, oh, Paul must be really frustrated. Mm -hmm. you know, Paul was mm -hmm. so full of fiery zeal mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. being, you know, locked up and in uh, chains, mm -hmm. how frustrating it must have been. Mm -hmm. And yet Paul wrote very serenely, mm -hmm. I fill up in my body the things lacking in the sufferings of Christ for his body, which is the church. Mm -hmm. And what our Lord has done is he has... Uh, permitted us to unite, mm -hmm. uh, unite our sufferings with his, mm -hmm. and they yes. become redemptive. That is a divine invitation. Thanks be well, to God. Well, thing. Mm -hmm. Animals suffer, don't they? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, we can suffer just like an animal. Mm-hmm. You know, the sufferings of an animal are pretty meaningless, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if there's their tragedy, but, but yeah, when we have that invitation to suffer on behalf of what is lacking in our Lord, oh my goodness, what a divine appointment that is. No, he, he, he allows, mm -hmm. he allows uh, for the church, us to unite our suffering with his, and these hours then become redemptive along with his. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's our opportunity to participate at Calvary. Yeah. You know, there is a whole movement that started during World War II in the air raid shelters in Trent. There were four Italian women. They were college students, and they started a movement called the Focolari Movement. Mm -hmm. you, have you ever heard of it? I went to Focolari meetings in Crosby, Texas, just about 110 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what they their spirituality, uh, much of their spirituality was was centered on uniting their sufferings. Now, remember, they were in a... They, this was during World War II. Mm -hmm. They were college girls. Mm -hmm. And they spent many, many nights in air raid shelters. Mm -hmm. And they started reading the gospel according to John. Mm -hmm. All the stuff that they'd been studying in college you know, didn't do them 
any good mm-hmm. in, their, in their raid shelter. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they develop a spirituality, and it revolves, the main, the main part of it revolves around uniting themselves with Christ, abandoned on the cross, mm-hmm. abandoned on the cross. Mm-hmm. It's a very, very beautiful mm-hmm. uh, Beautiful organization. Uh, it was very. It was growing in, in Korea when I was there. That's where I became familiar with it. Is Kiara Lubick is their founder? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does that name sound Italian? <laughs> Questions. It's German. It's, it's German. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You see, that part of Germany was uh, uh, earlier part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Oh, okay. And when World War I was over, you know, they carved up the Austro-Hungarian Empire, mm-hmm. and much of what was there uh, was transferred from, uh, from the austro well, from Austria, because mm-hmm. Hungary was separated from Austria, mm-hmm. transferred from Austria into you know, northern Italy. So mm-hmm. you have a lot of, lots of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the town where they started, the name of it was Trent. Uh-huh. That's where the council of Trent was held. Okay, that's amazing. When I, when I was uh, in Korea, the, there was a priest who uh, was the, um, I forget what his title was, in the nunciature in, in Seoul. Uh-huh. And guess what his name was? Bresson. Ah. B-R-E-S-S-E-N. Does uh-huh. that sound Italian? Mm-hmm. No, that sounds German, doesn't uh-huh. it? Mm-hmm. Uh, later, he became the bishop of Trent. <laughs> oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So much uh, up there, in a, right under Switzerland, mm-hmm. and, and through there, uh, you have a lot of German stock. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, is there anything we have left to cover today? What a day. We have crossed continents. We have crossed times. And I learned... Um, I learned some of the fruit of St. Maximilian Kolbe's prayers today. What a fascinating story. The work uh-huh. of grace. The work uh-huh. of grace. Uh huh. Oh, thank you so much, Monsignor. Okay, and uh, greetings today to Nikki. Uh, Nikki Hamala. Nikki Hamala. Hey, hi, Nikki. And to your mother and father, if, they're, mm-hmm. uh, if they watch this. Mm-hmm. I hope and so. And finally, mm-hmm. uh, fear not, little flock. It is pleased your father to give you the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, friends. We'll see you soon.